Hey everyone, Woohoo! good to see you. Glad to have you here. We're so excited to welcome Aaron Hamlin, the direct, executive director for the Center for Election Science today to speak with us about approval voting and a bit about the history of the center itself. Without further ado, please welcome Aaron Hamlin. Hey everybody. Uh, so I'll go ahead and share my screen now. Oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh no. It, it fooled me. It, it said the button, was, it gave me the button, but the button wasn't working. All right, well now you're a co-host. You should again. be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. Great. Cool. All right, should be able to see everything now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just so we know each other a little bit, um, like uh, Aaron mentioned, I'm the executive director for the Center of Election Science. I also uh, started the organization uh, when we incorporated. I've um, been looking at voting methods for over a decade now. I've uh, been involved in effective altruism since 2017. Um, and uh, personally, I also uh, do uh, jujitsu as well as uh, lock picking. Uh, so some, some fun uh, side stuff. So um, it's kind of a, a brief history of CS. Uh, I think uh, voting methods is kind of a, an interesting place to uh, arrive at. Uh, and it wasn't always that I had the, the concept of what a voting method was. That is this information that you put on the ballot and it's calculated by some way to produce a result. Uh, and that was kind of vague and nebulous to me at one time and pretty much invisible. Uh, that changed when I was in grad school in 2008. And it was during the election uh, cycle, and we were all talking about who, who we were going to vote for. And I noticed that all my friends were voting against their interests, and I knew them pretty well. Um, and so it was kind of a bit baffling to me, and I was taken back. And uh, uh, rather than kind of let uh, annoyance overwhelm me, I went and uh, looked at, well, why are they voting against their interests? And then we can to... Uh, uh, be aware of the concept of voting methods. Uh, and uh, in this journey, I uh, found an online Google group uh, for a bunch of mathematicians and engineers and folks with political science backgrounds interested in all kinds of different voting methods. And so uh, it was uh, this place where uh, I uh, enriched my, my uh, learning and exposure. And I was kind of curious at this point because uh, there were all these smart people together, but I was asking like, well, like, are you doing anything that actually um, like produces these outcomes that gets this stuff done? And I didn't really get a very good answer. Um, and I said, well, like, I don't really know how to do that stuff either. Um, but uh, by this time I was in uh, law school. Uh, so I uh, joined our law school's nonprofit incorporation program and learned how to uh, do all kinds of uh, fun paperwork and uh, set up the initial structure for nonprofits. Uh, and so uh, this was 2011, and this was basically the very origin of the organization. Uh, and so what, what fun uh, way to see the timeline for an organization by uh, 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 crappy uh, website uh, home pages. Uh, so uh, we, we've gotten much better in terms of our uh, aesthetics. Um, so you can see like right from the beginning, the first one is 2011, then 2013, then 2015, then 2017, and then 2020. Um, so you can see kind of visually this progression of uh, how things looked over time. And it and, uh, 2013 uh, was when we created a, a video about approval voting. And so there's this interesting component where we had to think, okay, well, there are all these different voting methods. Uh, which one do we really get behind? And it was um, uh, approval voting's combination of performance with looking at winner selection, also being able to capture candidate support in a clear uh, and uh, accurate way, as well as having a lot of practicality to it. Uh, and so in a moment, I'll talk about approval voting. And we also were able to uh, build during this time our board of advisors. So you've got Stephen Brands who really created the academic foundation for approval voting and then a number of really kind of 
hotshots in the academic field who have looked at comparing different learning methods. So a quick look of if you don't already know what approval voting is, uh, this is from an actual ballot uh, in a city that we were able to get approval voting passed in. With approval voting, you simply select all the candidates that you approve of or you would like to see elected. You're not ranking or anything complicated. You just global in those circles um, to all the, all the folks that, that you approve of. Uh, and then the candidate with the most of the twins, the results are really easy. Um, it's just most of the twins. And you can also show it as an approval percentage, which is the number of approvals that a particular uh, candidate gets over the number of ballots uh, cast and getting an approval percentage. So very, very simple. And so uh, why is this such a good uh, voting method? So one is it does a good job in winner selection. Um, and so that is the, the candidate that the voting method picks. And uh, changing the voting method doesn't always change the winner, uh, but in some cases it does, particularly when you have more complicated scenarios. And so we looked at this through uh, polling, through game theory, uh, as well as through computer simulations. And here, this is from one of our uh, board members work that uh, he had done independently, uh, uh, former board members that he had done independently. And here we can see when we were looking at different types of kind of dials or, or uh, components that we can manipulate, such as uh, how much tactical voting an electorate is doing. Uh, so like more, you, you do a little bit worse when voters are a little bit more strategic versus uh, being more honest, you, uh, voting method tends to do a bit better. So approval voting is pretty robust overall to tactics, not immune, but uh, robust to tactics and it doesn't have a lot of sensitivity or reaction to when people uh, are, are voting more uh, strategically. Uh, and overall, this, uh, this particular voting method does uh, pretty well. Uh, uh, particularly given its simplicity. So strong winner selection is one of the components that we looked at. Uh, accurate support is another. And we've actually gathered a lot of the data over time to be able to measure this. So uh, this is from the uh, 20, this recent uh, democratic primary. Um, and we, we took an, we started taking an innovative uh, approach that I'm kind of proud of for what we had done. So normally when you think of social sciences, you think like, okay, well, uh, you compare some experimental group to a control group, and that's pretty standard. Uh, but in political science, particularly with comparing different voting methods, there was no, like we didn't see any kind of control measure. And we thought, well, there should probably be one. Um, and so here we had, uh, we use what we call an honest assessment scale, where we ask uh, respondents to assess each candidates on a scale of, of uh, zero to five, where they would score each candidate. And uh, to kind of give us a control measure. And we can see that this control measure uh, mirrors pretty well approval voting, which is interesting because uh, I think some folks might look at approval voting and like think like on its surface is like, well, like it doesn't seem like you're providing a lot of information, uh, but in the aggregate, it actually captures it quite well. And we can see that compared to uh, plurality voting or choose one voting method, which is terrible. Uh, and here you can see that it just, really dies off, particularly when we're not talking about front runners. And another voting method, ranked choice voting, also known as instant runoff voting, um, you might think that it appears that you're putting more information out there uh, uh, by, by doing rankings. But when you, again, when you look at a candidate uh, before they're eliminated, how much support that they got, again, like you're getting maybe a little bit better than priority voting, but nowhere near as much as uh, you should for these individual candidates. Um, approval voting in contrast, you see, you see it mirroring that line much more closely. So it's not, it doesn't uh, get the exact image, but it does a pretty good job, particularly given the information that you're providing. Um, another, sometimes uh, folks will look at approval voting and think like, oh, well, well nobody's going to choose more than one candidate. Well, uh, sometimes it makes sense to only choose one candidate, but in many cases, uh, it makes sense to choose more than one. Um, and even when folks choose, uh, even when most folks only choose one candidate, it still makes a difference because of really two factors. One is that the margin of victory between first and not winning uh, is often less than say a percentage of, of the uh, electorate uh, that would uh, um, 
uh, say choose more than one candidate. And so that that margin of victory is is often um, uh, can easily be made up for when it when it matters in terms of the the folks that are choosing more than one candidate, even if there aren't that many of them. And then the other component is even when not a lot of people choose more than one candidate, it uh, can still make a difference in terms of that reflection and support for kind of newcomers as well as independents and third parties. Uh, but in any case, you can see the frequency distribution from this particular uh, poll that we had done. Um, and one thing that we tend to see in the in the literature as well as with research that we've done is that as the number of candidates increases, the number of, appro of average approvals per ballot tends to increase as well. Um, and uh, I think that kind of intuitively makes sense on a number of levels. Uh, so here's a, another one. This is uh, the same primary, but just a little bit later in the year. Uh, again, we see the same kind of thing, um, uh, particularly con uh, in comparison to this honest ass assessment score. You see a, a bit more of this, uh, this mirroring. Um, and then like you can look at both plurality voting as well as ranked choice voting. And you, you see a lot of that uh, support just being, being lost altogether. And again, here's a frequency distribution showing that not everybody just chooses just one candidate. Uh, 2007, uh, this is a French study uh, by our advisor, uh, Jean-Francois Lassier at the Paris School of Economics. Um, here, this one actually did change the election. Uh, Baru, a more moderate or centrist candidate in, uh, in, in this particular electorate size, um, actually uh, was able to win under in this poll using approval voting. And again, you see that same kind of pattern with third parties and independents as well. Uh, this one didn't particularly didn't use a control measure, uh, like I said, like we uh, came up with that idea a little bit later. And again, is a uh, frequency distribution in terms of seeing how many uh, people chose more than one candidate uh, on the ballot. And here's another one. This is from the 2016 election, um, and here we see jumps with uh, both Johnson and Stein in their approval voting. Uh, so, so we saw winner selection, we saw um, that kind of accurate capturing of support. Um, and then the other component is uh, simplicity, practicality, um, and cost. And those, those things can make a, a big deal. Uh, so approval voting is appealing in a number of these ways because uh, you might look at, say, uh, a ballot with a long number of candidates, which, I mean, uh, Many cities and elections can have a dozen candidates, and that's not at all unusual. Uh, we've seen primaries where you have close to twenty candidates, and so you're seeing a lot, a lot of this uh, particular uh, potential here. Uh, and even with a long candidate list, you, I mean, you, you call earlier with the style of the ballot, it makes it a minimal to even a longer candidate list, where you can imagine like having to say rank that number of candidates. Uh, in many cases, cities truncate their ballot um, so that you can't rank more candidates and as a consequence, you lose valuable uh, information. And you also don't need uh, fancy voting machines. Uh, you see in the cities that we helped to get approval voting enacted, uh, they actually had issues with being able to uh, take on the cost of new voting machines. But this is not a barrier for approval voting. Uh, you also don't have any kind of technical delays with the counting. It's a precinct summable, which means you um, don't have to have all the voting data in one central location. You don't have to wait to count before you get all the votes. It's convenient in a number of practical ways uh, for elected election administrators. Um, and then on a kind of a technical bonus aside, uh, when we think about national popular vote or like interacting with say the national popular vote plan or, or that particular interstate compact, uh, approval voting works well with those types of setups because uh, even if you have like holdout states where you're trying to figure out a national popular vote that maybe still are using plurality voting to choose one method, because the type of approval, because approval voting is such a simple type of data, you can count it alongside it. Whereas like you use say another voting method, it could be, you, you have different types of data, like say ranking data and kind of traditional choose one data. It's very difficult to add those uh, together to, cut, to sum up with a, a national popular vote. Um, and then as a practical point with the precinct summability, it makes the national popular vote a lot easier as well. Again, just it hits a number of practical points well. Um, so uh, we've seen kind of a brief history of the organization and then um, kind of where, we, where we've gotten. Uh, a lot of the early days of the, of the uh, Center for Action Science 
was um, putting together uh, a bunch of information on our website, trying to build out our, our network. Um, but our budget was really under $50,000. And it's, it's difficult to change the world with that kind of budget. Um, but that changed in 2017 um, when uh, I had attended my first EA Global and started to uh, learn more about the EA community and basically pitched the idea of using voting methods as an effective intervention. And the Open Planthropy Project tended to uh, agree uh, with, our, with our argument. And we received a grant of just over $600,000 uh, for um, our, our initial funding. And so this next part is pretty proud of. So keep keeping in mind, like we, we went into the voting method um, uh, uh, kind of scene agnostic in terms of like what kind of horse we were going to put in the race and chose approval voting because of these categories because of these components um, but approval voting actually hadn't been implemented for government elections anywhere in the U.S. and hadn't really been used uh, anywhere at all since Greece in 1920 before they switched to uh, proportional representation uh, and so uh, uh, basically we, we, we bid off quite a lot is, is one way of kind of summing that up uh, and so getting initial funding at the, at the very tail end in December of 2017, um, we decided to go in pretty strong and uh, we were able to hire our initial staff right away. Uh, so it's uh, Caitlin and Ali Pena and Kirsten Elliott. Uh, those are our first two staff members other than myself as executive director, uh, which before then I wasn't able to work uh, exclusively for uh, CES, but at, at this point was able to um, devote all my time uh, to the organization. Uh, and then here comes the story of our first win. So again, like we wasted no time. We, this is 2018, the, uh, the same year we got like our funding, well, technically just into that, into that year as we got it at the, uh, the final days of 2017. Uh, and so uh, when I say Fargo, this is the exact Fargo that you're thinking of um, from the uh, Coen Brothers movie. Uh, that is technically not the actual wood chipper from the movie. Uh, they have it outside of the visitor area, uh, but I think you can recognize Caitlin there from the image before. Uh, she's thus uh, screamy uh, and I'm less frightened in the earlier picture, but uh, that's us. Uh, and, and Fargo, uh, like a lot of cities, they had a situation on their hands. So this was a election for their commissioner. Uh, as you can see, their winner won by a whopping 22% of the vote. Uh, Hardly a mandate. It's hard to do much when uh, that's that's what you're coming away from the election with, and so uh, uh, the commission realized that they had a problem, uh, and it was apparent to everyone. And so they created the task force, and the the, t the task force job was to come up with a solution, looking at voting methods. And so uh, this particular person who came to us, uh, Jed Lumpke. Jed is the, the tall one. They are all very tall people. In this picture, um, I am six foot one. Uh, Jed is six foot eight. So just to give you an idea of scale here, uh, and uh, Jed is a, a, a grew up in, in Fargo, and so he had reached out to us and learned about approval voting, uh, and said like I I think this is going to work well for our community. It it seems to address the problem, and also it's very um, easy to implement. Um, so uh, they weren't interested in uh, uh, changing and buying a bunch of expensive voting machines. And so um, the brought it back to the task force. Task force got on board. They, they were supportive of it. And so um, just showed that it was very uh, easy to do. It wasn't a big change. Uh, but the, uh, the city commission uh, was not, uh, they, they acted as if they cared about changing uh, the voting method and wanted the solution. But in practice, they did a whole lot of nothing for a long time. Uh, but uh, Jed, he was uh, pretty annoyed by that. He said, I'm not gonna wait around for you doing a whole lot of nothing. And so he got a, a bunch of people together and gathered signatures and put approval voting on the, the ballot. Uh, and so, but doesn't end there. You gotta, you gotta run a campaign once it gets on the ballot. So we worked with uh, Jed and helped him organize uh, um, reform uh, Fargo. Um, so that's a local organization with a bunch of local volunteers and uh, helped him with the education campaign. And Jed uh, went to the airwaves and told everybody about approval voting, how awesome it was. 
and uh, just talked all over the place. He did a great job. Uh, lots of campaigning, lots of local support. Um, yep, all kinds of great, excited people. And uh, this this is, there's a lot of campaigning. We, we did a lot of best practices for the campaign here. Uh, interestingly, this is uh, uh, Dakota, one of our volunteers uh, in, in Fargo. Uh, she actually uh, reduced her work hours uh, during this campaign just so that she could uh, um, do more volunteer work. Uh, and this is her uh, daughter who got on the local news uh, pushing for uh, measure one to get approval voting implemented. Uh, so it was an adorable campaign all around. Uh, and of course, with all that hard work, uh, we won with 63 and a half percent. And this was in November of 2018. Um, and keep in mind, the grant that we got, our very first grant was at the very end of 2017 in December. So less than a year uh, from our initial funding, we hired staff and implemented a voting method that had never been used anywhere in the country before. Uh, so we're very proud of that. So, and we won by a whole bunch, which makes it even better. Um, and uh, so we got to see it implemented uh, and used this first time in 2020. Traditionally, approval voting is a single winner method. Um, uh, in this particular case, it was used to elect two people. Uh, and unlike uh, all the other elections in Fargo in recent memory, uh, this had both of the uh, candidates who won uh, managed to get over 50% approval. Um, so it was, it was very uh, unique and a bit of a change of pace compared to the issue that they uh, saw before where they just had uh, vote splitting all over the place. And interesting too, you could see that kind of reflection support for candidates who were a bit newer. Uh, so for, in for instance, uh, Rochelle, um, this was uh, uh, who came in last with 16%. Um, but this was her first uh, time running and under a normal um, uh, election where uh, they couldn't choose as many candidates as they want, wanted, uh, someone like Rochelle would get just like a, a hardly any of the vote and she wouldn't even be able to really show up on, on the radar. Uh, but this gives candidates like her and, and other new candidates a chance to grow. Whereas like before they would just be completely dismissed. So with that uh, big win, um, uh, Open Fan 3 Project said, uh, well, it looks like you could do what you said you uh, would be able to do. And so here uh, we have more confidence. And so they were able to provide us with another grant, uh, this one for 1.8 million, um, expected to uh, last through the end of 2021. Um, and so uh, we were off again and we hired a new person. Um, the, Bearded uh, gentleman in the front is uh, Chris Rowling. Uh, Chris is our director of campaigns and advocacy. Uh, so he would help us with our next campaign. And uh, uh, a little bit, uh, so into 2018, um, uh, we were also able to do an interview with uh, Rob Wiblin and 80,000 Hours. Uh, and it uh, turns out some people listened to that, uh, including uh, some folks in St. Louis. Uh, one person in particular, uh, Rob Schaaf, uh, who was connected with some folks at Show Me the Integrity in uh, Michigan, had said, uh, uh, had, had kind of communicated this idea to others because they were looking initially at uh, ranked choice voting as, uh, as a particular solution for their city, uh, but they were running into all kinds of obstacles, just practical obstacles, and then uh, listening to 80,000 hours and then saying, like, hey, um, not, not only is this uh, possible because you don't need to change any kind of voting machine issues, but this looks like it's actually gonna work well. And so um, uh, we quickly made friends uh, with uh, all, the, all the folks in St. Louis. And uh, St. Louis really did have a big problem. So uh, for instance, you can see here the, uh, so St. Louis was a, a little bit unique in that they had close, closed partisan primaries for their city elections. And in the US, in, uh, in major cities, it tends to be heavily democratic uh, dominated. So whoever win, wins the closed primary in this kind of situation is really the de facto winner uh, for the election as a whole. And so um, here uh, we saw in an early, earlier election, uh, the winner of this primary winning by 32%. And of course they had no competition in the general election. So 
uh, they would go ahead and, and win in the general. And this was a really big issue in St. Louis. So St. Louis has a, a large black community. And what we saw here was a lot of these uh, folks who uh, uh, were trailing uh, the, the winner uh, were all uh, candidates from the, from the black community. And as a consequence, their vote was divided multiple ways. And, and, as, uh, and then someone that didn't actually represent a lot of the people in St. Louis wound up winning as a result of this vote splitting. And so uh, the solution that we worked with here uh, was to um, take uh, this close primary system and we made it an open nonpartisan primary. And there were some technical aspects in Missouri law that made it so that you had to use um, plurality voting in the uh, general election. And so what we did here, we did a nonpartisan open primary that used approval voting. So it dealt with the vote splitting of an open primary. Then the top two would go on to the general election. And so like before, we worked with the folks in St. Louis and got a bunch of people on board did the signature gathering um, and they organized as STL approves. We got a bunch of people uh, joining on board um, to uh, uh, support uh, the, the measure, um, uh, both major newspapers, Cori Bush, who recently uh, won her election, a uh, number of local organizations. And uh, of course we managed to uh, win this time by even more than in Fargo by 68%. And this also goes with the idea of not only replicating in terms of the efforts that we're doing with approval voting, but also scaling. So Fargo, North Dakota was 130,000 people. St. Louis is just over 300,000 people. So not only are we, are we replicating here, but we're also scaling um, by more than double. Um, and so, uh, interestingly, the, uh, the mayor, um, who was an incumbent, and we recognize all the advantages of an incumbent candidate, decided not to uh, reseek um, election um, uh, after the proposition passed, um, uh, perhaps expecting that she would not win um, uh, if she wasn't able to take advantage of the, the vote splitting. This particular candidate also um, uh, had a little bit of a controversy with the end of her term where she uh, doxed a number of protesters in St. Louis by reading off their publicly uh, identified information. So talking about their, um, their names and their home addresses. Um, so uh, but, uh, she will not be seeking re-election. And uh, interestingly, the city council also um, at the last moment decided that they uh, weren't a fan of approval voting, uh, perhaps recognizing that um, they also, many of them, not, not all the city council, but some of them um, were, uh, were, were not in support of the measure, perhaps um, fearing that they wouldn't be able to uh, win with the, the fraction of the vote that they had previously. But um, we were still able to overcome that, that opposition as we saw. Uh, so what is, so this is a bit interesting with the first two um, basically campaign wins that we had in such a short time. So these are, uh, two uh, uh, cities uh, within three years of, of our funding. Um, and so interestingly here, it was a little bit more passive with both Fargo and with St. Louis because in both cases, they basically came to us uh, and we were a bit more reactive. Whereas we now have a director of campaigns, uh, Chris, who, who I pointed out to you earlier. And now we have uh, chapters uh, across the, the US now. Um, and so we have all these not chapters of people who are interested in starting a chapter and we have uh, uh, organized groups in a number of major cities now. Um, and so these chapters themselves, these are self-organizing groups. So we have a spot on our website, uh, we'll take action and start a chapter uh, where folks can come in and um, initiate these, these chapters and we provide them resources um, in particular, we're looking at states and larger cities um, uh, as a way for them to organize with other people. And we provide them resources on how to run these campaigns as well as the steps that they need to be able to move forward. And so just as easy as go into that take action button and join the chapter program. Um, 
And we also do requests for proposals um, as a way to incentivize uh, these chapters to move further. Uh, so we provide them with a roadmap on what to do, um, but at some key points where it could take a little bit of funding to move forward, uh, we work to make sure we, we ask them to send in a proposal uh, to basically uh, forces them to organize their activities and their planning. And uh, uh, we provide uh, in some cases in kind, uh, in, uh, in other cases, direct funding, depending on, on their setup to be able to move forward with getting closer to being able to run that campaign. And we have a bunch of proposals, um, uh, Seattle, Utah, Austin, uh, there's, uh, and we have other chapters who did submit proposals, but are, which are moving further on. So Dallas uh, is another one that's not on here. Um, the uh, state of Missouri, there's a, uh, so we're seeing some states come in here, as well as some uh, um, uh, organization in the, in the Bay Area, though not the cities that are using uh, ranked choice voting. We're not um, interested in that kind of intersection. And overall, like uh, this is very expensive as an as a example. Um, some campaigns that other organizations weren't able to win, uh, like in Massachusetts, that campaign cost uh, $10 million uh, for the state of Massachusetts. They lost that. Um, and that's just direct costs. That's not counting any kind of indirect costs. Um, you look at Alaska there, that's like $7 million. Uh, they won by one percentage point. Um, and there's also, uh, I don't know that the funding is explicitly um, uh, public uh, from these other organizations, but in, in North Dakota, as well as in um, uh, it Oklahoma, there's, uh, I'm forgetting the, the other uh, Southern state off the, off the top of my head, um, but uh, there are two additional states uh, that um, were removed from the ballot after a lot of organization as well. Um, so this, like, uh, so the, the, uh, as an organization, we have a very high ceiling uh, as well. So like the direct cost for these campaigns is very high, particularly as we take on larger populations. And then the infrastructure cost uh, is also uh, uh, pretty high, although we, we've shown that we can run efficiently, but some of the other organizations in this space, just the organizations alone, uh, not counting the, um, uh, the direct costs for these campaigns um, often have budgets of like three to five plus million dollars. Uh, whereas uh, in these years, our budget has been um, uh, uh, 650,000 to a million dollars. And right now we're around a, a million dollars for, for our budget uh, annually. Um, and so these are costly campaigns, uh, but also very efficient in terms of the uh, looking at the outcome. We do these chapters, uh, we get greater and greater wins for this traction in order to, to be able to attract support for the next campaign. Um, so that's, that's it. Um, and given that it's the year end, um, I would uh, also uh, encourage folks to consider us in their uh, year end giving. Uh, I wouldn't be uh, running a real nonprofit if I didn't have a donation ask at the end of the at the end of the presentation. Where you are, I'll go ahead and put that in the uh, chat, so it's nice and convenient for you as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Aaron. This is really amazing, amazing work. Uh, we had a couple questions. If you do have questions, I'm going to read the ones that have been posted in the chat. If you do have other questions, you can unmute yourself and ask them. But I'll start with the one from David Green. Uh, approval voting rewards wide, shallow support. Is this a plus and why? Um, I don't know that I would necessarily agree with the, the premise of the question with the, the, the shallow component. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, what we, like, as I showed earlier, um, in terms of, okay, well, what makes like a, a good winner? Uh, so we would argue that the winner is the candidate who maximizes utility for the electorate. And we can measure that directly. We have measured that, that directly uh, from the uh, uh, perspective of, of individual respondents. And we see that accrual voting is able to kind of match that uh, pretty well overall relative to other voting methods. Uh, so I, I don't know that I would necessarily call it uh, shallow support. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Nirav asked, would there still be primaries under an approval voting system? Uh, so it can go either way. So it, what we do, 
we tend to be more data oriented. So we look at the circumstance uh, and the, the makeup of the uh, location that we're uh, that we're working with. Uh, we talk with people in the community. We also do polling, um, and based on those factors and the data that we receive, uh, allows us to figure out what kind of integration we have. So you can do approval voting with or without a primary. You can just do it like a one and done type deal, or you can do a primary, like you can do closed primaries with approval voting and just have, uh, like normally you would do, if you had closed primaries, you would have them choose just one candidate. You can do it with approval voting. You can do it with that kind of open system that we had before. You can have uh, an open system with two people going to the general with four, however many you want. So. Approval voting's simplicity uh, really makes it adaptable to a number of different contexts, which gives it an advantage really in a number of ways. Um, we, uh, we saw that in uh, St. Louis because of some of the issues with state law, we had to do some workarounds with that. Um, and we see that uh, also with other opportunities such as in Texas, which has some um, peculiar state laws that um, uh, approval voting's flexibility allows us to work around. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've also asked, does approval voting impact the use of negative campaigning? Uh, so with, so here I, I would be kind of forced more to hypothesize, um, like these are things that are measurable um, and we'll see more as the uh, elections using approval voting uh, are, are, are used more. Uh, but if, if you, it's, it's a lot easier to get away with negative campaigning when you have a system that discourages a bunch of other people from running. Um, and then another component is uh, if you're negatively campaigning, then it's, it, it may be a bit difficult for people to approve of both you and another candidate, like if you're bashing that other candidate. That makes sense. Uh, Matt asked, why aren't you interested in intersections with regions that already use ranked choice voting at some level? Uh, so uh, why don't we throw elbows? Uh, so uh, I would say one is the the lowest hanging fruit is where uh, we're our, where we're going up against really the worst voting method there is, or choose one voting method, and just as a practical sense, like that's that's uh, way easier. Um, we also work in a space with other uh, organizations. Um, and like, while we may not necessarily like CS, we uh, may not agree in terms of the, the merits of other, of other voting methods, but we still work in the same kind of space um, by choosing to kind of like throw elbows rather than work in an area where um, there hasn't been an intervention yet uh, is a great way for us to, to lose friends in the space. That makes a lot of sense, <laughs> of course. All right, I'm going to open it up to questions in a sec. I have a question, though, that I'll jump in here first. I've heard of Arrow's paradox, or the paradox of democracy of like, oh, there's five criteria you'll, that everyone would want in a functioning democracy, but you can't have all five. Um, and like, there's no, there is, <laughs> there is no election format that will please everyone, in a sense. Is that true or is approval voting the, the least bad of, of all options or is there anything that method in your ideal world is approval voting the one that we all that we stick with or is there some like if you could wave a magic wand perfect voting system out there that you're you know is like waiting like a diamond in the rough cool well I, i've actually i i write a ton and i've actually written an essay on this explicit uh, topic uh, which i've shared in, in the chat so this this uh, idea that arrow came up with and won the nobel prize for um, I believe he was the youngest person to win a Nobel Prize in economics when he, when he did it. Um, and I also got to uh, meet uh, Kenneth Arrow. So like you look at the link, you can also, uh, in the earlier part, there's a link to the interview that I did with Arrow, uh, which is one of the only interviews I really saw that actually went more in depth on voting methods and his theorem um, from like, an audio interview. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, Arrow, he looked at he took a kind of a classical criterion-based approach. Um, that is, he said, okay, well, I don't think a voting method should have like these properties. It would really be, it would be really bad if like uh, a voting method would um, kind of su succumb to this kind of drawback. 
And he, he said some, some kind of some uh, basic drawbacks that he thought that a voting method shouldn't have. And he said, uh, and then he said, okay, well, is it possible for a voting method to never succumb to any of these drawbacks? Is, is it possible for that to even be accomplished? And his theorem laid out that no, like these, these kind of basic properties that we want to have in a voting method um, can't be accomplished all the time. And, but there's some drawbacks to the criterion-based approach because a criterion-based approach is not sensitive to a couple of factors. It's not sensitive to the frequency to which these anomalies or criteria are broken. Uh, and it's also not sensitive to the severity that a criterion is violated. So for instance, if, it, if a criterion being broken caused a worse winner to be elected, how much worse is that winner? So is it just like a little worse or did they get like the, the, the worst candidate of the, of the lot that was, that was running? Uh, and so there are, uh, so another kind of like point here is that Errors theorem also applies only to ranking methods, which he identifies as well as in, the, in that interview. Um, and, and you can also like, if you want to look at his theorem, you could also see that it applies to just ranking methods. Um, but even, even kind of that said, like all voting methods have their, their drawbacks to them. And so uh, what we have to think about is uh, what kinds of properties do we value in a voting method? And, um, and in kind of this presentation I just gave, I, I tried to kind of highlight that at a higher level. So thinking about winner selection. So on average, um, how, uh, how good of a winner, high, how high of a utility winner do you typically get given some slate of candidates? Um, uh, what kind of, uh, of measure of support do you get for, for all the candidates, even the ones who don't win? And then what kind of practical issues do you have in um, administering an election with a particular voting method? So, uh, so what we've tried to do is look at some of these kind of general properties of a voting method that we can value rather than saying like, okay, like we have this explicit rule that we're defining. Um, is this rule ever going to be violated by this uh, voting method. And, and if, it, if it can be violated, we're just going to throw it out and say like it's a total failure. And so we, we're not taking that kind of class, classical criterion-based approach. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. Jacob, you had a question. You want to unmute and ask it? All right, sure. So um, just about, uh, I understand that the, especially once you get to larger cities and stuff or states and so on, the cost becomes significant and that can be used as an argument against you and so on. Um, how much have you guys pushed the argument um, that, you, that they can save money by skipping primaries. Because my understanding is that the main reason we usually have primaries is to avoid a sort of vote splitting scenario where somebody, you know, gets a, like, like you were showing, somebody gets 20% of the vote, but nobody else gets more than 20% of the vote. So they manage to win. So to avoid that scenario, we have like multiple stages of voting where first we have a primary and then we have a second major election. Uh, or maybe I'm not using the right term, but like in France, you know, where they have like the uh, Right final off. runoff between the top two candidates. It would seem to me that with approval voting, you should be able to skip that and do it, as you said, one and done. And that could save millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, that is a, a route to, to go. And in some places, it may be that that's the, the right way to go. Um, but when we are um, looking at a particular locality, we look at, um, are there particular state laws that may like require um, like their interpretation of a majority, like I write kind of separately on how that's kind of weird the way people think of the concept of, of, of majority. Um, but uh, when that comes up, like we actually may have to do a top two uh, approach to satisfy their interpretation. Um, and then another component is thinking about what people want. So like if if we did kind of like a one and done, but like but when we poll people and they say like, ah, actually like we actually prefer to have a primary, um, like we have to pay attention to that because in the end, like we want the initiative to pass too. Uh, so this, this kind of looks at both the parameters that we have to deal with as well as uh, what's likely to, uh, to win uh, overall. Uh, but we, we do pay attention to that. But and I think that kind of goes back to the simplicity of the voting method really giving us a lot of flexibility in terms of what we can do. That makes a lot of sense. All right, if anyone else has a question, Feel free to unmute yourself. You could also add it to the chat and ask it directly. Hi, Hi. can you hear me? Hi, Sebastian, uh, new here. Uh, 
So I love the idea. And quite frankly, it's one of the coolest innovative ideas I've heard of in a while uh, related to elections. But what horrifies me in a polarized time like this one is that the one argument, anyone that has a slightly complex position uh, that sounds unpopular at the beginning, but is well supported by evidence uh, can effectively make in a political environment in which no one is actually really reading through any policy white papers is, uh, well, most voters think you're crazy. So even if I agree with you, I'm not gonna push it. Uh, and you can say that more politely in like one or two sentences and then just move on. Uh, I'm progressive, but I'm a pragmatic progressive. Uh, think of your equivalent if you're a Republican. What happens when you eliminate the idea of, what, what happens when you actually allow anyone uh, to see just how much support they have? Because I think we all know that there are a lot of really, really terrible ideas that do have wide support. And to find that out without suffering any consequences and to allow parties uh, to figure that out without any consequences. Like right now, in, in the circles that I've been in, and they're relatively moderate places, uh, at least as far as college campuses go, the only argument you can ever make for a position that's not the most extreme one is it's electorally unacceptable. And it's the only way to say anything without being considered a traitor by the people around you. So what happens when you just wipe that off the map as a possible defense point? Uh, so, I mean, um, approval voting does do a good job of kind of gauging candidate support. Um, and uh, it's a voting method. I mean, it, it's uh, blind, so it doesn't care if like the electorate has uh, like some, like there may be like an anti-vaxxer segment of the uh, electorate and like perhaps like some uh, uh, candidate runs on that platform. I'm sure it, it's already happened before. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so it, it is blind in, in that respect in terms of like uh, being able to capture support. But one thing to kind of be mindful of is um, not just with the support that's captured, but also like who winds up, up winning um, and what kind of candidate is favored under different voting roles. Um, so a, as an example, and so there's one concept in voting theory called the center squeeze effect. And, and that is, imagine like a, a normal distribution of the, uh, the electorate and uh, having three candidates, like one like right in the middle and then like uh, one on either side of that candidate. Under plurality voting, um, that candidate in the middle is not gonna fare well if those other two candidates are kind of squeezed kind of close to them because that candidate in the middle has their vote divided on either side and they basically squeezed out hence the, the name and then the, the other two candidates, who, whoever has a longer tail uh, is able to, to pull up and, and manage the win. Um, and so in, in, in that circumstance, we're saying that a candidate who is more extreme, and this is under our current rules, um, is able to, to move forward. Whereas approval voting, um, that candidate in the middle would be favored uh, because the, the candidates who are like center right and center left on that on that dynamic can also support the candidate in the middle to hedge their bets against that candidate on the other extreme being able to win. And, uh, and so, and in terms of winners, like approval voting can help buffer against that kind of extremism. Um, but it's also worth pointing out that that uh, kind of center squeeze effect happens not only, uh, can happen not only with plurality voting elections, uh, but also in runoffs and also um, ranking methods that simulate sequential runoffs. Uh, we saw that in, explicitly in uh, elections like in the uh, 2009 Burlington Vermont election, uh, there was a candidate in the middle, more moderate, that got squeezed out uh, and caused a, a far left candidate to win. Um, and then in uh, 1991 in Louisiana, there was a gubernatorial election, very weird election uh, worth reading up on. Uh, there were three candidates uh, there who were, who were mainly in contention. Um, there was uh, uh, Buddy Romer, who was a more moderate uh, candidate, 
there was a, um, a, a corrupt uh, Democrat candidate who had a, a like a bunch of uh, he would later go to, to uh, prison for felony charges uh, that he committed while in office. And then there was uh, David Duke, a, a Klansman, uh, and this uh, tender squeeze effect allowed the Buddy Romer candidate to get squeezed out. So he didn't make uh, the, uh, so this was an open, open primary with a runoff. And so Buddy Romer uh, got squeezed out with the fewest votes. And so it was the corrupt candidate with David Duke. You had this very terrible election in the runoff where you had more extreme candidates. Uh, and so while, while approval voting does kind of, does do a better job in terms of capturing support, um, it also does a better job in terms of making sure these extreme candidates uh, aren't able to, to move forward like they are um, in these other types of scenarios we can see under different voting rules. Sweet. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Yurav, you want to ask it? I saw you voting in. Or, okay, I will, like, I, I have lots of questions on the last one. Um, <laughs> you, you mentioned um, simplicity and it allows for longer ballots with more candidates because because you're just going through the list and saying whether you approve or not. But uh, are, are, how concerned are you in, in those situations that um, voters don't have enough information or at least are, aren't paying attention enough to really know whether they approve of so many candidates on a list? So like, let, let's say we you you remove a primary stage and voters just don't have enough information or, or don't have enough attention to, to determine whether they approve that such a long list. Yeah. Well, I mean, in some cases already, we, we have we can have longer lists of, of candidates. And I think one question for um, for the kind of thinking about well, longer lists with the, the current system is like, well, why don't people learn about some of these other candidates? And I think the reason is there's no incentive to. Uh, with approval voting, if you like a candidate and they're your favorite, you, you are always incentivized to support that candidate. Uh, and you can make sure that they get that reflection of support uh, whereas under our choose one method, if there's a candidate, say like they're a third party or independent, they don't quite have the same kind of name recognition. Um, but like you're incentivized to learn about them because like maybe they like some of the issues that you care about that you feel aren't getting the type of attention that you think those issues deserve. Um, uh, under say there's a longer candidate list and using approval voting, now you're actually incentivized to uh, learn about these candidates. And if you're interested in those candidates and um, you're not able to get information about them. Well, that's kind of more of a failure on that candidate not to you know, do things like make a basic web page or uh, things like that. Um, <laughs> the, the, another kind of component that comes up too is when we uh, think about ways that candidates are disenfranchised and we miss out on new ideas, uh, we see that a lot with uh, say debates and debates often you, they have to often use uh, uh, objective criteria and often that criteria is polling. And so if you're using uh, uh, approval voting uh, for the election, you mix it's also use it for the polling as well. And we see that these candidates uh, are able to get a much better uh, reflection of their support. And if they're able to do that in polling, it's likely that we're gonna see more folks in, in debates as well. So um, that's another kind of way to that approval voting through indirect means can also make sure that voters are able to hear about these new ideas and these other candidates that uh, are uh, that uh, that are bringing these new ideas to make sure that they actually get airtime and aren't marginalized unfairly, much like they are now. Beautiful. That, that, I guess that's mainly about like prominent elections, but let's say you're talking about something more down ballot, where people have trouble paying attention anyway. Um, how would approval voting affect that? Uh, so I, I would say like just a kind of a similar answer, which is like you're still incentivized to make sure that those candidates get that reflection of support. And if you can't figure out, uh, like, and if the number of the candidates is, the, is roughly the same, then um, I think we have perhaps another issue there and just making sure that, um, uh, uh, well, I mean, there are, there are other organizations like say League of Women Voters uh, and, and others that really, their mission is more aligned in terms of making sure that we are aware about these candidates and, and different issues. Um, the, the voting method can make sure that those, uh, that people are incentivized to learn about them um, and that they get that accurate reflection of support. Uh, but a voting method can't make you learn about uh, a candidate. So that's that's kind of kind of on the impetus of the, of the voter. 
and making sure that uh, these other uh, nonpartisan groups have an incentive to make sure that like, hey, um, we all have a civic responsibility to learn. It's also try to make this easy for people to learn this information too. Awesome. Thank you so, so much, Aaron. This has been super, super enriching and really hopeful, actually. It's amazing to see the work that you're doing. Of course, if you, any of you want to support their work, you can go to electionscience.org slash donate. Uh, we can drop this also in the Facebook link afterwards. Uh, and to stay involved with your work, you could follow along on their website and their Facebook page as well. And to stay in touch with other Effective Altruism NYC events, go to effectivealtruism.nyc. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. and. Take care and we'll see you next time. Bye. Oh, thanks, thanks a bunch, Aaron. <laughs>